This video is sponsored by Squarespace. You know, I'm a simple man and I have simple tastes. I like big watches. I like big computer monitors. I even drive a big truck. So why is it that I have these tiny little home theater speakers? That seems like something that I should fix. So today we are going to build the bigger brother of these little speakers. We are going to build the overnight sensation TMM tower speakers. And we're finally gonna to put to rest the question of are bigger speakers better? And we're also gonna try not to violate as many principles of good speaker design as I did with these ones. Sound like fun? All right, let's head to the shop. So inside this box, we have all of the internal speaker components that we're gonna need for this build. But like any good speaker build, we are going to set these aside and we are going to start by building the cabinets for these speakers. And uh, today we're gonna do things a little bit differently than I've done in the past. Let me show you. Today, we are going to be building our speaker cabinets out of MDF. Now MDF is actually the optimal material to use for speaker cabinets because of its uniform density. However, it looks like this. So it's gonna present some interesting finishing challenges for us, but we'll talk about that once we get to it. For now, let's just cut this guy up and assemble it into a box. The problem with using hardwood to make speaker cabinets is that because it's a natural material, different parts of the wood are going to have different densities. And that can introduce distortion as one area of the cabinet will reflect sound differently than another area of the cabinet. MDF, on the other hand, doesn't have that problem, so it should make for at least a slightly better sounding final speaker. Since these are tower speakers, I started by ripping some long, narrow pieces and then cut them to length on the miter saw. You can see here that I set up a little stop block to make sure that all of my pieces ended up being the exact same length, which should make my assembly later on a lot easier. All right, now that we got all these pieces cut, we are almost ready to start assembly, but before we do that, we have to make some window braces. What's a window brace? Glad you asked. Let me explain. A window brace is a brace with a window in it. It's kind of like a horseshoe. It's all in the name. Seriously though, it's a brace that adds strength and rigidity to a speaker cabinet while still allowing for air to move around freely inside, which is important for a tower speaker because one of the main advantages is that massive internal air volume. Having a lot of free floating air around inside the cabinet means that the drivers are able to more easily and efficiently do their job of moving air in front of the cabinet. Compared to my older, smaller speakers, these new ones should have a lot more low and mid-range oomph while still being able to deliver crisp pies. Perfect. Well, Shop Zach finishes nailing together those boxes, I'd like to talk to you about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. If you need a simple streamlined way to get a professional looking website up and running in 2022, Squarespace has you covered. Hopefully at this point, you all know that I recently started a new podcast, Off The Cut, along with Eric Spensley. And for our podcast, we needed a website. So for that, we turned to Squarespace. Their website creation tool was so easy to use, I had a website up and running in about the same amount of time that it takes us to record an episode. They even have pre-made templates specifically for podcasts. All we had to do was edit the text, move elements around on the page, and then upload some of our episodes. They even handled registering the domain for us. If you're looking to start a website for your business, passion project, or just next creative endeavor, I can highly recommend Squarespace. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash builds to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. All right, let's get back to building these speakers. Finally, after a lot of glue and even more nails, I got both cabinets fully assembled. And then I took a few seconds to wipe off all that excess glue. So there's one speaker cabinet done and then two speaker cabinets done. Or at least we're done with the back half of the cabinets. We still have to do the fronts. And here's the thing, I don't wanna make some boring rectangular speakers. So I think we need to find a way to spice up the design of these front baffles a little bit. We just need to find some inspiration here in the shop. Hmm. Mm. Maybe. Now we're talking. 
That's it. We're going to use the power of plagiarism to design these front baffles. Give me a couple seconds to whip something up on the CNC control software, and then we are going to cut these guys on my X-Carve. 20 minutes was all it took to whip up a quick design, and the machine got to work cutting out some fresh face plates while I busied myself with a couple of other jobs. Well, the X-Carve is over there doing its thing. We're going to, um, you know what? This is dumb me yelling. I'll just tell you guys in a voiceover. The one downside to the X-Carve is that it is quite loud. On the back side of each cabinet, I needed two two-inch cutouts. The first one, up top, is a breathing port that allows air to move in and out of the cabinets as necessary. And then down below that is a hole to mount an input plate where I'll eventually connect the speakers to my AV receiver. Then it was back to gluing and nailing MDF. Originally, I was going to install these front panels after I put all of the guts inside the speakers. However, thanks to my new front plate design, that wouldn't be necessary. A quick peek over the X-Carve showed me that my robot competition was making really fast progress. So if I wanted to finish before it did, I needed to step up the pace. With the glue barely dry on the front panels, I started cutting out a rather large opening up top on both cabinets. This will eventually be where the drivers get mounted, but first we're gonna need some front plates. Let's go check on those. All right, the carve is done. Just about the same time as me finishing the modifications to the box, however, I gotta give a slight edge to the machine. It did beat me by a few minutes. Now, these are going to sit on the front of the speaker cases, well, something like that. So obviously these guys are still a little rough around the edges from the initial carve. So why don't we clean them up, get them painted and get them ready to be installed. After punching the centers out and sanding off what was left of the tabs, I set up over on the router table and gave all of the exterior edges a good healthy round over. One of the reasons, aside from aesthetics, that I wanted to add these front plates to my speakers is because they should help with sound quality. On my old speakers, I recessed the drivers from the front face of the cabinets, which theoretically adds a bit of interference to the sound waves as they're coming off of the drivers. On these new speakers, the drivers will sit perfectly flush with the front face of the cabinets, so there's nothing in the way to introduce any distortion. All right, we're gonna leave these guys to dry for the next little bit. While they do, we're gonna get started on the electronic components that go inside these speakers. This is a crossover. And what it is, is a relatively simple circuit that sits inside of your speakers and separates out the different audio frequencies and sends them to the correct drivers. It looks complicated, but I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You don't have to be an electrical engineering genius to figure out how to wire up your own crossover. In fact, I don't even know what half of the components on this board do. However, I am able to follow very simple and very clear instructions like the ones that I got when I purchased all of these parts for the crossover as a kit from Meniscus Audio. So the only real skill you need in order to assemble your own crossover is the ability to follow instructions and to work a soldering iron. And honestly, you don't even have to be that good with a soldering iron. I know I'm not. In order to give myself some landmarks to work off of, I started by screwing my terminals in place, <laughs> which can be a little tricky at times. These are the junction points where you will connect all of the various components. Then I moved on to placing the capacitors, inductors, and resistors. There's tons of different ways to mount these, but I prefer CA glue because it sets really quickly. So now that we have all the components roughly where they need to be and twisted together, it's time to do the actual soldering. And check it out, I went and got myself a little soldering station kit as a treat for myself to make this project go a little bit faster. When you first start soldering, your crossover is going to look like a giant bowl of spaghetti with wires going in all sorts of different directions. But just take it slow and follow the instructions. Before you know it, you'll have a clean organized circuit that's ready to be installed. Oh, and as a little bonus step, I installed these solderless connectors to the ends of the wires that run from the crossover to the drivers. This isn't strictly necessary, but it will make installation and any troubleshooting you have to do a lot easier. So I think it's worth doing. And done. All right, now I think we need to address how we're gonna finish these cabinets. Obviously, I wasn't just gonna leave these cabinets as bare MDF. I don't think that would look very good. So today we're gonna do something that I have never done before and I'm quite excited to try it out, but also kind of nervous. We are going to 
That was significantly less slick than I thought it would be. Today we are going to veneer these cabinets with some uh, real wood veneer. So I think the first thing we need to do is cut down this big giant sheet into some more manageable sized pieces. When it comes to pre-cutting veneer like this, don't get too fancy and cut it so that it's the perfect size to cover the face of your cabinets. Make it an inch or so too big and that way you'll have some room for error later when you go to install it. Trust me, it'll be a lot easier. All right, now that I got all these pieces cut, it's time to start attaching them to the cabinets. And in order to explain that step, I think I'm actually gonna switch to voiceover because it's about to get real stinky in here. That's because I opted to install my veneer using contact cement. After a bit of research online, this seemed like it would provide the best hold, but the downside is that it's quite stinky and quite toxic. Oh, and also the installation process is really weird. Let me explain. First, as you can see, you roll it onto both of the surfaces that you want to stick together. Try to distribute it as evenly as possible, but don't work it for too long because it starts to set up really quickly. Which is good because it does need to dry fully before you can adhere it. I told you, it's a bit weird. Then, once everything is dry to the touch, you can finally start bonding. I use these wood dowels as spacers to help with alignment, and then once I had the veneer where I wanted it, I removed them one at a time. As a final step, I use this big glue roller to press the veneer to the cabinet. And that was that. It's a bit odd to have two seemingly dry surfaces bond together so well, but hey, it seemed to work. Before you move on and start veneering your next surface, it's probably a good idea to trim the excess off of the surface you just did. Some people will use a trim router for this step, but I found a sharp knife did the job just fine and a little bit of 220 sandpaper smoothed over that freshly cut edge. I made a pretty good mess while installing my first few sheets of veneer, but by the time I got around to doing the 10th, 11th, and 12th face of the cabinet, I was starting to get a good feel for it. If possible, I would highly recommend you do a few practice applications before jumping into any mission critical work. All right, well, that was uh, challenging to say the least, but. Hey, I learned a new skill today, and I think these look pretty decent overall. I mean, obviously it doesn't look as good as a full hardwood would, but you know, from two, three feet away, it's really hard to tell that this isn't real wood. So now the next thing we need to do is cut out all of the holes where all the components are gonna go. So let's do that with a drill and a trim router. And really, I just needed the drill to make a hole for the trim router to get started. In. Once it was in there, the flush trim bit made short work of all the openings that I veneered over. Now, one of the nice things about working with veneer is that it's basically pre-sanded and ready to go as soon as you apply it. However, I am gonna do a little bit of sanding. And the reason for that is, well, just because I've been kind of rough with these while I've been moving around, so I've got some little scratch marks on them. There's also a couple spots where the glue dripped over the edge when I was veneering other sides, and I just wanna polish off that glue and make these look nice. But I'm not going to do the full sand where I start with 80 grit. I'm gonna go right to 240 because this veneer is really thin and I don't want to burn through it accidentally. When you're working with material that's this thin, it's really important that you keep the sander flat and don't hold it in the same position for very long. If you try to round over an edge or something like that, you'll burn right through the veneer before you even realize it. So just be careful. See, just like I said, real quick. Now, as much as I would love to continue on my theme of trying new things by trying out a new finish, Unfortunately, I really want these speakers to match my existing speakers, so I'm gonna finish them with the exact same finish that I did those other speakers. It's water-based polyurethane. Roll it on, give it a sand, roll on another coat. It's gonna be a little bit boring, so honestly, we're not gonna spend much time on this. In case you can't tell, I'm getting a little bit sick of these hybrid polys, so be on the lookout as I try some new finishes over the next few projects. All right, that is it for finish. So we're gonna let these guys dry and we'll start assembling them. First, we'll do the easiest bit, these breather ports. They just tapped right into place. Next, I did the input plates, which were slightly harder, but not really. And then it was time to mount the crossovers. 
I carefully lowered them into position, screwed them to the back of the cabinet, and then connected all of my wires. So we got our crossovers mounted inside the speaker cabinets. We got our plates in place. And now before we go any further, I wanna take a quick second and stuff these cabinets full of this stuff, which is Dacron. And the point of Dacron is to absorb and dampen any renegade sound waves that might be bouncing around inside your cabinet and muddying sound quality. In the past, I've used polyfill for this step, which is the filling that you would find in a cheap dollar store pillow. Honestly, I'm pretty sure it's the same stuff, but this has a fancy brand name attached to it, so it obviously performs way better. Wish I had made these windows inside here a little bit bigger. I keep scraping my elbows. That up a little bit, pull this one through here. Now we're ready to install the face plates. I wanted these plates to have a smooth, seamless look, so I had my work cut out for me. I glued and then nailed both of the plates in place. I then filled each of the nail holes with a bit of wood filler, cleaned them off with a damp rag, and then quickly repainted everything. Oh, and if you're worried about repairability, don't be. The crossovers are small enough that they fit out of the four inch driver holes. So if I need to get in there, I can. The paint is now dry and we are ready to finally install our drivers. We got ourselves a little bit of an issue here. You see, I bought these cool little hex head screws and in preparation for that, I bought some hex head impact Allen, hex head impact Allen key bits. What am I saying here? Anyways, I can't find them anywhere in the shop. So I'm gonna teach you guys a little trick. We're gonna modify this Allen key to be a bit that you can put in a drill. First, you're gonna to wanna to clamp it securely in place and then hack off the last two inches or so using a bandsaw or something simple. Take that little bit that I just cut out and put it in the front of your drill. A little something like that. Good to go. Oh, and before I forget, each one of these speaker drivers comes with a little uh, self-adhesive sound dampening ring that goes inside the cutout for it. At this point, you're probably starting to notice a little bit of a trend here. Good sound quality is all about isolating the drivers. You want to hear the sound waves that they're making, not the drivers rattling around inside their own cutouts. Next, it was finally time to start installing the drivers. Because I attached those little solderless connectors to the ends of each wire, this was really easy. All I had to do was clip them to the contacts and then drop them in place. Then, using my newly created Allen bit, I was able to quickly and easily screw them in place. Just be careful you don't over crank them as the metal flanges are quite thin. Ooh, does that not look nice or what? Love me some good hardware. So at this point, we're basically done. However, I would like to do one last little bonus step before taking these guys home. So if you'd be so kind as to join me around over here at the bottom of the speakers, I'll show you what I'm talking about. I decided to add four leveler legs to the bottom of each speaker. Not only will these keep my tall tower speakers from tipping over on uneven floors and potentially injuring someone, but they also have these felt pads on the bottom of them, which should help to dampen the speakers by isolating them from the floor and providing yet another very, very slight increase to sound quality. There we go. With that last little piece in place, we are done. So let's take these speakers home and finally answer that question of are bigger, properly made speakers better sounding than what I made before? And spoiler alert, I think they probably are, but we gotta go home and find out for sure. Oh man, these are heavy. Oh my God, why did I make them so heavy? Are you guys ready to see how these speakers sound? I got them all set up and the only thing left to do at this point is to press play. If I'm being completely honest, I actually have had these speakers set up for a few days now, and I've been listening to them and trying to gather my thoughts for this outro. I think the headline is, they sound great. And I mean that, they sound really, really good. Compared to these smaller speakers, they have much better low and mid-range clarity, which is great for listening to music, but the area that I've found where it's made the biggest difference is listening to dialogue in TV shows and movies. 
it's just so much easier to understand people talking. It's interesting too, because I've never felt like I was lacking bass before. This big subwoofer here behind me kind of has that end cover. But I think where I was really lacking was in that lower part of the mid range, if that makes any sense. So yeah, big speakers are definitely better and I'm glad I upgraded. So now let's talk about all those things I did like using MDF instead of hardwood and using Dacron instead of polyfill. I can't rightfully say whether or not those things made a big difference because I don't have a good point of comparison. The best I can do is an apples to oranges comparison with these old speakers and I don't think that's worth much. But I will say this. One of the things that I've learned from making my own speakers is that you don't really know what good speakers sound like until you get a set, bring them home and start listening to them. And then after a few days, they just kind of sound normal to you. You essentially just raise the bar for what your own level of acceptable audio quality is. Now, I know that might sound a little bit discouraging at first, but hear me out on this one. If you take the time to build a set of speakers that you're really proud of, you're always going to enjoy them. Probably not for their technical accuracy, but you'll remember all the things you learned while making them. And whenever somebody comes over to your house, you'll be able to say, yeah, I made those. And to me, that's always going to be worth more than some small imperceptible increase in sound quality. All right, everybody, that is it for me and for this video. So thank you so much for watching. Big thank you to all my Patreon supporters who you can see listed over here beside me. Links for everything that I use will be down in the video description, and I will see you in the next one. Peace. Oh, and uh, just for funsies, I'm going to do a quick A-B comparison between the old speakers and the new ones. I'm not sure how well it's going to translate onto video, but hey, let's give it a shot and try. One last thing, I promise this is it, but uh, I just wanted to say real quick, don't worry about these old speakers. They are not going to go in the garbage. They are going to be repurposed as the rear channels for my new surround sound setup. That's right, I'm finally gonna live the dream of having a proper surround sound setup. Never had it before. Really excited to try that out. And I will probably be making some speaker stands for these guys, so stay tuned for that. All right, see you for real.